Welcome back, episode 22, Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today's show, we had Dan Ryan. Dan's kind of like a Silicon Valley guy. He's a startup kind of dude. And we brought him on the show to talk about Li-Fi, uh, smart technologies, addressable technologies, monitoring crowds. Man, this was my favorite podcast by far, just for me personally. I enjoyed it the most. Uh, thanks to Dan Ryan. This is a good one. I won't tell you much more about it. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Keystone Technologies. Scotty, throw that screen um, slide up on the screen for our YouTube watchers. Um, I want to talk to you today about their LED fluorescent tube replacements. Oh, boring. Come on, call again. Is there something better than, than LED T8 tubes? Well, you know what, man? The vast majority of applications that I upgrade are to LED T8 and LED T5 tubes. So let's talk about Keystones. They got their direct drive. Direct drive is rip out the ballast, run the line voltage to the sockets, and bam, you're done. No more ballast, no more nonsense, okay? The second one is smart drive. You got a customer that just wants to go LED real, you know, real low cost, just change the tubes. You pop in those smart drive LED tubes and you're, you're done. And the third is, which is most interesting, is their combo drive. They have a combo drive LED tube, which is both a direct drive and a smart drive. So that means it's both bypass and ballast compatible. So once that ballast fails, they just remove the ballast from the circuit and run it to the line voltage. Man, who thought of that? That's an awesome idea. So go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-T-E-C. Oh, I forgot the E. K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, man. Keystonetech.com. Check out their smart drive and direct drive LED tube replacements. Love them. They also got T5. They got a whole bunch of accessories there. You can't go wrong with Keystone. Great warranty, great people, best customer service in the industry. Remember, this podcast is the official podcast of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Hey, that's where Greg and Josh and Ira and Fred and all those guys from Keystone and I met in the first place, but seven, 10 years ago now. That's right. So the National Association is a place of innovative lighting distributors is a place where people that sell light bulbs every day get together and act dorky and talk about light bulbs all day. Our wives run. They're, well, there's girls there too. Their boyfriends run away and get away from these dorks, these lighting dorks, but we love it. We love to talk lighting. We love to learn about lighting. We love to learn about the business of lighting. So go to NAILD.org. That's nailed.org for information on joining this association, training programs, and so on. There's an announcement coming up from Nailed sometime down the road here, but join now before the announcement comes. Oh, that's my hint. Oh, NAILD.org. Without further ado, man, my favorite podcast of all time. Thanks to Dan Ryan for coming on the show. Episode 22, Get a Grip on Lighting. Welcome to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, Dan Ryan. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Say hi to Greg Eric. Greg, what's happened? Good to see you again. You Big too, fan Dan. of the Thanks pod that you guys here. are doing. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. It's exploding. So, Dan, tell me, um, uh, what's the biggest barrier you see to the adoption of IoT? Well, it's, it's a really interesting question because if you look at it um, at the base level, what needs to be in a building? You need lighting, you need building automation, you need things like furniture and chairs, you need networking equipment, and increasingly companies are looking to add IoT services, um, things like indoor positioning, things like asset tracking. So um, buildings want this stuff. The question for lighting is what is the role of lighting and actually participating in the sale and the distribution of IoT services? And um, one of the big challenges for lighting comes down to the channel. Um, typically the buyer of somebody uh, who wants IoT services, the person that really cares about IoT is not necessarily the same person that's gonna make a decision about lighting. Um, so the big challenge for lighting is to figure out how to navigate some of that complexity. Um, to actually reach the real buyer for the IoT service. You know, I was watching a, a, a Greg, did you see that uh, Lights of the Round episode one that Tom Butters put out? Did you get a chance to watch I haven't it? looked at it yet, but I know you sent it. Yeah, they were they were talking about, um, you know, the complexity of of this. And, and Dan just kind of brought it up indirectly. It's like the person that's concerned with IoT is not a lighting designer. You know, and how does that impact the creation of these buildings, Greg? Like, I mean, when you're going in, when you're going in to address the lighting, 
Are you going in there to, to address the addressability of the lighting in the future? Yeah, I, I, that's one of my main questions is, is are you even going to need to have a lighting background to be in lighting in the future? Is it is it going to matter or is it all going to be somewhat standardized in terms of capabilities? Can they all tune to certain colors? Can they all dim to certain levels? Is that what's going to happen and every fixture is going to be able to do this and now it doesn't really matter the knowledge you have? Do you guys see that being possible? Go ahead, Dan. Well, I mean, I, I think the question is to so take it one step back. You know, what, what are what are you selling today? When you talk about IoT, when you talk about a controls, um, how are you making that sale right now? So My I'm a, assumption I'm a stupid, would be, I'm a stupid lighting controls guy. I don't believe in smart lighting controls. Sure. I think ninety eight percent of all applications, or ninety percent, or eighty five, whatever you want, can be effectively controlled for energy savings with stupid lighting controls. The only reason to go to something different would be value in addressability. And nobody has been able to explain to this host of this podcast why that's even valuable. Oh, we can store yeah, the information, I exactly, Dan. We can store the information. I would say you're exactly Dan. right. Um, <laughs> for the perspective of your, your, core, your core buyer, right? Because who are you literally talking to when you make that sale? What do they care about? They care about energy code. They care about the quality of their light. Um, all the applications that they care about are, are lighting applications. So if you come in, you start talking about funky IoT stuff, um, it probably goes right over their head. So then the question is, um, you know, are, are you the right person to even drive that sale? Because it's not actually helping your core buyer. How about we a, ask a, this? a lot of what you hear about. What, what is about. driving the sale? Yeah. That's the question. What is driving the sale? I don't know what it is. What's driving the sale? Yeah, today lighting controls, right? Um, in the, but if the, you can do everything with, value. if you can do everything with with stupid lighting controls, what's driving the sale of uh, you know addressable lighting control systems? It's cool. So <laughs> it's cool. There you go, Greg. It's yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. so you're, you're, you're exactly right. Right to your to your core buyer, right? But but if you look at the you know the rest of the building, you know the the, the other um, items that people are going to spend money on in the building, um, so called IoT systems, um, they are going to budget for that. But it's going to be much later in the in the buying cycle. Um, um, when compared to when the lighting sale happens. The lighting sale is going to happen up front, but the other sort of equipment that will get deployed in the building is going to happen much later. So I think this is, again, fundamentally the challenge for lighting is that you're probably not talking to the right buyer. They just don't care about any of this IoT stuff because it doesn't talk, it doesn't solve a problem for them if Who you're cares? selling to the core lighting person. Who so cares? the people that do care are people with um, other needs within the building. If you talk in the context of corporate office spaces, the property people care about um, how their space is being utilized. They care about space utilization. They care about um, how the conference rooms are used, who's using the desks. So all those things are core for them, but they're not necessarily involved in the lighting sale up front. I thought you were going to um, say the National Security Agency or the FBI or something like that cares. <laughs> <laughs> um, they might care, but but um, not not as much as some of the other folks in the building. Um, so so that that sort of I, I call this the impedance mismatch of the sale of IoT systems. I gotta write that down. Um, impedance mismatch. That's a great the term. impedance I love. mismatch. I was an electrical engineer. Um, so so when, when you're specifying the lighting system up front, all the IoT stuff doesn't really matter. So that's why you hear a lot of people in the, in the industry talk about future proofing a lighting system which basically means layering in sensors and network connectivity and a bunch of stuff that somebody later down the road can benefit from um, and leverage to deliver, you know, these other value added IOT applications. Let me tell you something. But in that about initial that. sale, Man, hang on, they don't hang care. on right there. Hang on right there. Future proofing. Okay. So I'm going to give you two examples. Okay. Number one, I have an old iPod. It's completely useless. That's right. Okay. I, I, we called up my wife wanted to like control my kids devices with some Apple thing, like Apple parent thing or whatever. And we called up Apple, like we have this old iPod. It's like an iPod. Can we just use that? And they're like, uh, that belongs in the Apple museum, son. Can't use that. And then, uh, so future proofing, what, how do you do that? The technology moves so fast. Like my wife's phone won't work on the system of her car because the car is not the Bluetooth system of the car 
is not upgraded for Android Marshmallow 5.6.2.5. So she can't talk on Bluetooth in her car until she gets it back to the dealership and uh, Chrysler upgrades their um, uh, system to have uh, the new Marshmallow in it or whatever it is. A lot of this stuff is not, I, I think it's a lot of complexity here, Gregor. What are you thinking, buddy? How's yeah, your wife's I mean, Volvo? Is she talking on her phone in her <laughs> Volvo? <laughs> she is actually, yeah. But a new iPhone, so that's what you need. But yeah, that, that's where it, it kind of confuses me too, is, is all the different, the complexity of it right now and how you're actually able to sell it and when you're going to be able to sell it. That's what I'm always interested in. And I think we're at the initial stages yeah. as everybody's at. And just trying to figure yeah, out exactly where it's right. going. And it's, the, the, the other aspect of that is when you install a lighting system, you, you hope that that system is going to last for the lifetime of the building or a significant portion of it, you know, five, 10 years. Um, but no, IoT no, sensor Dan, no, software. No, Dan, 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 hang on a second there. Hang on. Oh, the am, the amortization, right. <laughs> the amortization of a lighting system, according to the Canadian Revenue Agency, and I'm sure the IRS has the same thing going on, is 20 years. So they will amortize amortize the life of a lighting system over 20 years. So people are expecting it to last 20 years. 20 years ago, 1998, buddy. That's even worse, right? So, so if you're looking at uh, about that from the perspective of how fast technology changes, how fast sensors will change, um, that's the argument against future proof, right? So is is it is the lighting fixture necessarily the right place to put an IoT technology? Does it need to live somewhere else? In the building, and, and again, that's that's the great challenge, I think. With, uh, I, I, with think I, of, I think I know where it needs to live. I think I know where it needs to live, Greg. Um, the uh, so I don't know. So is the so Dan, your your company Verge Sense. Give us a plug for your company. What's the website? VergeSense.com. Yeah, Ver, VergeSense.com. Um, we are not directly in the lighting industry. We're a sensor company, um, right. and we sell standalone IoT sensor systems uh, right. for, for measuring. So what, what's the products. what's your yeah. biggest sales barrier, man? Why is it that you're not a millionaire? Or maybe you are, but why is it that you're not like p cranking out those sensors you showed us at the nailed convention? What's the problem? I mean, we're, we're early, we're less than a year old, um, but uh, the way we go to market is direct. Uh, we go through a uh, direct sales relationship with the end user. Um, so we don't go through any of the traditional channels uh, or distributors that, that um, you know, lighting typically goes through. So uh, we have a purely direct relationship uh, with, with our customers. So for, for, for us, there's no dependency on the lighting channel as far as um, how we go to market. I'm looking at Greg. He'd probably beat you up if you're in the same room with him. Have you said something like that? <laughs> <laughs> different models. There's different ways to different do it. Different models. But we're, we're not. Yeah, just, right. this, is, this, is, this is kind of my point, right? We're not, we're not in the lighting channel. We don't, we don't sell lighting. Um, for us, you know, our sensors could be used for lighting control. Um, but we don't target that application at all. We, we're focusing on higher level functionality um, for, for the customer. So we're not tied into lighting control. And one of the ways we are able to sell a lot uh, quicker um, is that we have a standalone system. We're not tied to the building construction cycle. Uh, we can go in and install sensors basically in any building. Um, we're not tied, tied into specifications or, or on the, the, the traditional work you would see there. Uh, so that's sort of our approach. Um, and again, you know, couple that against the, um, the traditional approach for, for lighting is to try and bundle, uh, sensor technology and IOT technology with the sale of lighting systems, um, which has its own benefits as well, but it's because of the channel dynamic, which you guys being, you know, on, on the front lines, as far as selling systems, because of that channel dynamic and because of the difficulty of reaching the buyer, the guy that cares about IOT. Um, it's, it's typically a tougher, a tougher sell. Um, and that's why you've seen most of the initial successes as far as, um, large, you know, scalable announcements of, you know, successful IOT projects have been mostly, you know, in scenarios in which the, the customer has a direct relationship with the manufacturer. A lot of large retail stores, for example, have come out with big, um, IOT projects. Um, and that's because that channel dynamic for lighting is so complicated. It makes it very difficult to specify and sell IoT capability bundled with lighting. Now you say the word IoT. Do you also consider that smart lighting as IoT? Is that in the same range? Yeah, I mean it's same. they're all kind of you know meaningless terms at some level, right? They're they're buzzwords. They're thrown around. 
Um, when I think about IoT, I think about um, you know things that lights can do that aren't tied to the core value proposition of lighting, which is illumination and energy efficiency. Uh, so things like indoor wayfinding and indoor positioning, things like asset tracking, uh, things like space utilization, all, all functions that have frankly nothing to do with lighting, uh, but are enabled by smart IoT capable um, lights. Uh, listen, Dan, it's non-traditional. So I think there's an interesting play here with Li-Fi, Randy. Remember, when, so the episode before yours is Randy Reed, and he was talking about Li-Fi, Greg, and, a, and mm -hmm. how Li-Fi is going to revolutionize, like literally revolutionize the world. So the internet signals coming out of the light, right? And, you know, I mean, this idea of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all this sort of stuff, but what, and so those are radio signals, right? Am I right? Correct, Dan? Is that the right way to describe them? They're like radio waves? You're exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So radio waves travel at the speed of sound. Am I correct? They actually travel at the speed of light, but yeah. no, <laughs> it's, it's all Li Fi. Yes. No, yes. Li Fi travels at the speed of light for sure. Um, but what he was saying was it, that. It, it, Sorry, what's that? You just cut out there for a second. What did you say? Oh, sorry. No, you, you're, you're right. Yeah, Li-Fi is the speed of light. Li-Fi yes. travels at the speed of light. Apparently, radio waves are not as fast as Li-Fi. I mean, I'm, I'm, all, I'm just an amateur here. I'm just telling what other people have told me. Sure. And there, we, there may be a way that Li-Fi can actually look through the internet at things. Like, if, li if we're shedding our world, our indoor environment, and part of the outdoor environment, like parking lots and stuff like that, with light that's Li-Fi enabled, is that it, are those signals able to transmit data in some sense back in the future? So, you know, people maybe I'm going way off the, the the deep end, Greg, and you can tell me if Culligan's gone crazy again. But what I'm thinking is like if you're pouring internet signals on people through light, can it re can it come back? Can it report? Can, if Li-Fi is coming down from a lighting system and, and, and shedding internet signals through that light, can it, can it tell you if somebody's in the space? I don't know if we can even answer that right now. Like, does the internet know? Will, they, will the signal know if that space is occupied by something different than it was three seconds ago? Well, I, I think what you're talking about with Li-Fi is a good example of a potential application of lighting, which has nothing to do with lighting, right? It's it's not about illuminating the space. It's not about saving energy. Yeah, you brought it up. Uh, usually when people talk- You brought it up. When, when people talk about it, <laughs> beautiful. When people talk about lighting um, and Li-Fi, they're talking about using the lights for wireless internet connectivity. So replacing Wi-Fi with lighting. So expanding the functionality of light to, to do more, right? Much like your smartphone- No, you no, 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 wrong, 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 wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. If you go to Li-Fi, okay. you're literally walking through the internet. Like the matrix, bro. Like, think about it. If the, if the internet is in the light, you're walking through the internet. You're walking through the internet? Yes. That like, is... Think of, like, think about it. That's deep, bro. Sorry, I just swore it's, on the getting yeah, your money. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are doing up in Canada before this podcast, but but um, but yeah, that that is very deep. That it. And like, I think would, about I it. If, if the, internet the internet is everywhere. being like you, you're under the light. My my bald head is shining, right? And right. And you're now, sending data back. For, I love it. Yeah. I mean, you're literally in the matrix. You're in the man. internet. You're in the matrix. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very exciting stuff. I don't but, know uh, if it is or not. I might be scary, bro. It might be scary. <laughs> No, take the I'm red excited. pill. I, I'm getting, take the, I'm getting take the red pill. But, but Greg, maybe maybe uh, help help bring us back here a little bit. Yeah. So what I, what I want to ask about is um, so the, how it's being kind of used in a way now. Do you have that? And going back to your presentation at Nail, you talked about indoor positioning and how you can use lighting in retail space um, to basically sell a product. Is that something? You know, you talked about positioning it for retail, so it the, the light reads that you're in that space and it maybe hints that, hey, here's a coupon for this item. Is that kind of thing where you see lighting really taking off in retail? 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's been the, the, probably the, the earliest successes. Um, you've seen a lot of the mm-hmm. major lighting companies, all the major manufacturers have an indoor positioning product now. Um, and yeah. I would say it's the first example of, of an IoT application of lighting, the first real example that people are paying for and has been you know sold successfully in the market. Um, and that's one in which it makes a lot of sense because it's really uh, cheap to include additional radios into a luminaire, particularly for already you know, using it for controls. Um, so you can bet it, sell it, and then you have software that you can sell against the uh, uh, in conjunction with the, the lighting product. Um, that's the first one that I've seen. But as you know, coming back to before, you know, what's what's the real challenge? You know, for for a sale like that, who cares about indoor positioning in a retailer? Probably not the lighting people, right? It's the marketing people. It's the people that are operating the stores. Um, it's the digital people that care about uh, measuring the effectiveness of their ad campaigns, all that stuff. It's not anybody that cares about lighting. Um, so typically those sales happen in a very direct way. It's a different type of sale. So this what is, is what is the, the information I, I they the care about, Dan? What information do they care about, Dan? Well, in the context of retail, uh, retailers want to know where people are spending time in the store. They want to engage, send marketing messages to folks in the stores. They want to measure foot traffic. Um, they have a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, lighting is one of those ways. So that's the information that they care about in, in that context. Couldn't they do that by knowing where their products were on their shelves and what, what people bought? That's one way, yeah, but it's not necessarily perfect. You don't know if somebody you know picked a product off a shelf and put it back. Uh, there's a lot of holes in that sort of data. So um, that's why you're seeing a bunch of companies come with uh, – a whole variety of different sensor technologies, human observational studies, all that sort of thing. Lighting is is one of many ways to solve that. Do you um, like who's using but, this right? Who's using this right, really? Who's using this right? Like who's who's really got a good IoT information system in one of their retail stores? Like, is there a retailer that you know that's just totally balling that knows where everyone's walking around their store and all that? Yeah, I mean, almost any major retailer has deployed um, every major one from, you know, the, the Walmarts, the Targets, the whatever's the world has deployed um, some form of sensor system um, in, in their stores. They all vary. People are using video cameras. People are using Wi-Fi. Um, and now people have started to use lighting over the past couple of years. So there's a whole variety of different options there. When you say they're using um, lighting, what are they doing? What are they doing with the lighting? The application on the market now is um, is indoor positioning, so beacons embedded in lights, um, and then they use the lighting system to help people navigate throughout the store. Um, and there's been a bunch of public announcements um, of projects there from um, almost every major lighting lighting company. So, so, so what all happens? The you, major log, you log into the store. You log into the store on your phone, and then it tells you where to go. How does it work? Yeah, typically there's an app. There's a shopper loyalty app that you download. Um, if you go shopping, you de- retailers have apps. And then the um, the lighting infrastructure will help you navigate, find products using the mobile shopping app. That's crazy, dude. Yeah. No, on, on the... <laughs> crazy. Is, yeah. I mean, do you, do you use Google Maps? Yeah. yeah do you use Google Maps? I, I, dude, dude, I, let's just have a look at my BlackBerry, buddy. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. So you're BlackBerry. But yeah, all right. Come Google. on. All right. so, <laughs> so many of us do use Google, you know, Google Maps, um, and a lot of people have this, you know, the desire to find out where you are in a building. You get lost in a mall. Um, so it's just an extension of of GPS indoors. Um, but but I think again for for lighting, it's an opportunity to have a new you know new service to sell and deliver to customers, and this goes back to this, what's this challenge? You know, lighting, you, it's easy to add technology into luminaires, but is it easy, is it easy to actually sell that technology? And then again, to actually, sell the like, technology to the person. Like we talked about this before. Like, cares what, about what, it. Greg, what the hell are you going to do with the data, man? Like you're going to create billions of data points in a Walmart, like one Walmart store. What are you going to do with that, Greg Eric? Huh? I'm not going to do anything, <laughs> but Walmart, I'm sure, is going to find a way. He's to just going to count his money. <laughs> but come on, what are you going to do with that data, Dan? This. Come on, what are they going to do with it? 
that's that's exactly the point it, it, Greg you hit on I mean it's it's not it's not you right you're you're enabling your layout I think the salesperson has to be able to, the salesperson has to be in there saying here's what we're going to do with the data man how are you going to sell it? You can't go to some guy in the Walmart and say, hey, dude, listen, you're going to have a whole bunch of data after you're done. I don't think it needs to be wins. a lighting salesperson. We're not the people that know what they that, want the data for. Somebody at Walmart. On the lights, yeah, so most... If it's on the lights. Mo most, most, of what you've, most of what you've seen, right? So if you look at a lot of the majors, almost every major lighting company has announced a, an IoT platform of some sort, right? And by that, they mean they're going to partner up with you know, software companies, IT companies, companies that know how to sell that data and how to, you know, leverage that data. And, um, you know, the lighting infrastructure basically becomes a, a layer that sits underneath the software, kind of like an operating system. It's almost like lighting is windows and people are building applications on top of lighting. But it's usually not going to be the lighting person that will actually sell the actual software application. Typically, that would be somebody else. Um, and that's eventually where I, I see you know, the, the the, the industry going empowering the applications that live on top of it. Uh, but again, going back to the challenge of how do you get the smart luminaires in in the first place? If when you're selling them, that software app isn't built, that data acquisition isn't happening, and the person that you're talking to, because you guys are on the sales side, right? You do you do distribution, you do sales. They probably don't. The, the specific person you're talking to probably doesn't care about any of this IoT stuff. So figuring out how to navigate those two things is the big challenge. Um, and that's why initially you've only seen, you know, very large successes for these direct relationships. Haven't seen much in the way of channel stuff yet. And who are the very large successes? Is there anyone specifically you can talk about, Dan? Yeah, if you can go you public, a... all, all the majors, um, Phillips has announced a variety of projects. No, I mean, Kennedy's customers, announced a like, variety who, of like Kroger or Walmart or who, who's done something with this that really could say, yeah, yes, our payback is this because <clears throat> we were able to gather this data or that data. Like who's done that? Or is it yeah, just so, again, everybody, everybody publicly, has their IoT, oh, hang on. everybody has an IoT system out there, but nobody has a customer for it yet. Is that better, a better way to put it? Yeah, it, it's early. I think it's a very fair statement. There have been some public customer announcements by Philips and Acuity, real real customers. Um, I, I would encourage you to go look at those those press releases there. Philips and Acuity, and I think I think Osram's announced customers as well. Yeah, the, the um, Philips so that, that product and, is and real. Philips so, and yeah. Osram don't even have those names anymore. They changed their names. So I don't know if they're... Yeah, if they're, it's, it's, Signify now. Yeah, I think Led Philips said it a week ago and... Uh, Osram, I, uh, they have, uh, I, I, don't I don't know, know man. The name I don't know about here. this. I don't think they're going to get to my customers um, with their direct little model. Gregor, what do you think? Do you think they can get to your customer with their little direct, going direct and, you know, trying to sell them data? You get, you're going to sell your customers data, Gregor? Is, is somebody else going to sell? Is somebody else going to sell your customers data? That's I what think it you're is. Gonna it's sell data the sell. It's you're going to sell them the capability. They're going to sell them the capability. Like our lights can do this. And I, I could see a model for that. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so th and that's, that's where I think this goes, um, is that you, you sell the capability, you sell, it's part of the future proof story. Um, and, and, and you, you start to lay the foundation for the IOT applications down the road. I'm going to say um, but this, it's not an easy only sale. an idiot yeah. would pay more for a future proof fixture. There you go. I said it only as only a dumbass would say, I need to future-proof this thing for f***ing 10 years from now because... Slow down. Oh, there, oh, I'm going to... Scotty, mark that. Mark that. Mark it. I'm going to future-proof future this thing for 10 years from now because, I don't know, I might need some information from my lights. Come on, man. I don't know. I don't know, dude. Uh, it, I think there's it a depends on who you're selling to, right? I mean, yeah. I, I don't know the profile of the customers you sell to, but, but it, 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 all, it all varies, right? Tell I mean, me the profile who... of a customer. Tell me a profile of the customer that would want this, Dan. Like, not, well, I'm telling you, just maybe somebody would want it. Somebody might want it right now. Somebody might want yeah. it right now. I, I, but... I think you guys have had some horticultural lighting uh, yeah. companies in the pod. Um, mm -hmm. Data generation and horticultural lighting is very important for monitoring plant quality, right? Um, that's measurement, that's a, that's a really good vertical. Um, hospitals, healthcare tend to be another one that a lot of people are talking about. Office spaces, we see a lot of activity there. Um, it really varies, uh, but it's definitely not for everybody. 
Um, it typically is most valuable to larger customers. Uh, so customers with um, you know existing IT departments, people that are thinking about data and active management in the space. So it's it's more geared towards larger organizations, at least from what I've seen. Uh, for you know a small smaller uh, mom and pop type uh, lighting sale, you know IoT is is probably not what they need. Um, so it, it really depends on the specific customer that you're going after, but. Um, this stuff is real. Uh, there's there's a lot of real um, activity in the space. There's been public announcements um, as well. So, um, but it's definitely not for everybody. Um, I think the other sort of challenge that you've seen is that you know people tend to throw these terms around so much that they've lost their meaning. You must exactly. you know, IoT, true. smart lighting. Um, people should, and I think you, you're starting to see some of this, um, start talking about the the real value and the real products that get delivered. Um, and, and again, that, that will happen as it matures. It's a very new thing for the industry overall. Um, but I think you'll start to see more and more real announcements over the next, next couple of years as it continues to mature. Do you think the term smart lighting is the right term? I mean, to be smart, you have to be able to take the information and actually do something with it. The lighting at this point does what you tell it to do. Is there such thing as smart lighting? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's again overblown. I, I would I would agree with you that you know what what does smart really mean? Um, and and then ultimately, it, it is not just about data generation. It's not even just about capturing data. It's about analyzing data and doing something that's going to make an impact for for somebody else. You know whether that is generating a, an additional sale at a retail store, whether it's optimizing the design of a floor based on your measurement of the traffic in an office space. Um, it has to generate real impact. And thus far, we've still been in the, hey, we're going to hook up everything with sensors and collect a bunch of data phase of the market. Um, you're not seeing a lot of those real impactful, you know, value added products yet. You haven't seen a ton of ton of those yet, though you are starting to see some early ones. So, um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with, um, with, with that, that point there. I think, you know, I think you call it dork lighting, lighting, dork lighting. <laughs> so uh, where, you know, hey, I just want to be able to control my lights with my smartphone, whereas most people are like, okay, do it, and uh, you can do that if you want. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. going to just flick the switch. <laughs> that works for me. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to know if I could find out, you know, I could, so let's say you take a parking garage, okay? I have a lot of customers that have massive parking garages, and they have a system of knowing which spaces are occupied and which ones are not occupied. So they can say, go to level three. And uh, there's going to be 24 spaces there. And then on level four, there's 140. And then on level five, there's, you know, 260 or whatever parking spaces. Why, if that information is already available, isn't that space already occupied by other technologies? And why would lighting? Yeah, and this, that? this is the, the exact challenge, right? Um, the competitors for IoT are not other lighting companies. There's a bunch of other companies which sell mm. smart parking solutions yeah. or indoor positioning solutions or space utilization solutions, um, not necessarily lighting companies. So, so it's a different class of competitor. Um, and if, if you look at it from the customer perspective, though, the customer is probably going to save money if they consolidate that smart parking service into their lighting system instead of paying for lighting plus smart parking separately. So there's two different systems right now. What if the lighting um, they would what save if a, money? What if, if the they... light bulb burns out? What if the light the luminaire burns out? What happens then? The smart parking system fails? Much like how a sensor probably is going to go out in that smart parking system too. Um, it's typically going to be cheaper. You'd only pay once for installation up front. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't pay two different two different people. So there there are real cost savings by, you know, to the customer if everything is purchased at the same time. But typically, they aren't purchased at the same time. You're coming into the lighting job, you know, three years after the parking system is installed, and okay, at that point, how, how are you going to you know sell smart parking? And again, you're probably not selling to the person that really cares. So, so that's that matching the timing of the customer need with the construction project in which lighting is going to go in. Again, is that that major challenge? I'm um, kind of going back, and maybe we could even started with this, but you, you talked about at the nailed convention how lighting is like a smartphone. Or is you could see the model of it going that way? Can you explain more about that? The bundling, the unbundling, yeah, it, it all that. Yeah, it hits on. I, yeah, it, it hits on this this whole idea of of lighting expanding beyond doing one thing, 
So originally, you know, when you had phones in your house, maybe you bought a phone in 1985, it was, it did its job for 20 years. It was very good at calling people. And then uh, phones went digital. Uh, they turned to smartphones and your smartphone can do a million different things. You can call people, you can send text messages, you can browse the internet, look at YouTube videos. You can listen, to, you can let, you can listen to the get a grip on lighting podcast on your, on your cell phone too. As, as, as we all have been right in lighting. So you can do all these different things and, and, and lighting is starting to expand in, in that same way. It's not just the light anymore. The light can do indoor positioning, space utilization, smart parking. There's going to be all these different functions that live on top of it and it'll become a bundle of services and not a discrete thing. So that's the opportunity. But then the challenge is unlike a smartphone, when you buy a smartphone, you care about making phone calls. You care about listening to podcasts. You care about watching YouTube. You as the buyer, care about those things but typically the prize lighting doesn't care stuff that an iot smart lighting thing could do so how do you navigate that component of the sale i would say um, this and the sale would, becomes much more strategic. i would say this just to interrupt you because this is a round table i'm going to interrupt i would say that a, a lighting a parking garage doesn't necessarily need uh, a parking garage uh, a system that tells you that the spaces are empty or full but it needs a lighting system and if the lighting system, Absolutely. if the lighting system can do the smart parking, then there's no smart parking system. I think that's the advantage, the fundamental advantage that lighting has over the incumbents and the competitors is that every one of these indoor spaces has to have lighting. So the, if the lighting can do what the other systems can do, then the other systems are in big trouble because they can't do what the lighting system can do. So I think that's the inherent advantage in lighting. So if you can say, yes, you go, this is the value proposition. You go into your client, you go into them, Greg, and you say, look, you have your parking garage. People are driving around it. They don't know. And parking is a good example, I think, of this, of where it can be deployed effectively as a super good payback. You go into that parking garage you, owner and you say, look, you don't have a smart parking system but you have a lighting system and it's HPS or it's fluorescent or even it's LED maybe, maybe it's LED. And you say to them, look at, you're thinking about smart parking. Why don't you think about a lighting system that also offers you a smart parking system at the same time? And then, so now your payback is combined with energy savings from the lighting and maintenance savings from the lighting. And the fact that we have this software application that you're you can download and run to this meter that sits in front of the building that says how many spots are open on what levels. I think that's an application for this right now. I don't know. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, no, I think it, it, it makes sense if it's something they're considering doing for sure. If it has the capability anytime if, it can. Yeah, if you have a mall that says like a five a five story parking garage, Dan, and they have uh, and they and they want to do a smart parking system, well, why not upgrade your lighting system and get the smart parking guys out, out the door and just. Stick with the lighting guys, Dan Ryan. You're exactly right. And if you look at the um, the potential revenue opportunity there, I, I, have you ever heard of the 330-300 rule from JLL? Jones Lang Lasalle. So per, per square JLL? footage. Just Jones JLL, Lang yeah. yeah. That's, Jones a, Lang that's a huge company, it's, Dan. It's a little, it's a little cute, right? But. Um, but $3 a square foot per year gets spent on utilities, lighting and building automation, um, $30 a foot a year on real estate. So the, the cost of renting facility and about $300 a year on employee salaries, productivity, um, all these other things. Not per foot. So lighting right now. Not per foot. 300 per foot, foot. Per foot. Yeah. Yeah. On salaries. Yeah. So the rule of thumb. So lighting plays today in the $3 a foot ballpark. But when you start talking about IoT capabilities, um, like smart parking, indoor positioning, what have you, you start to get into the 30, the 300. And that's why you're just seeing all of the, you know, the major uh, manufacturers invest pretty aggressively in this area because it represents an opportunity for additional revenue streams, um, as well as, you know, opportunities for the, for the channel to sell more product. But the sale process has to be more sophisticated. So you can't just come in and, and talk about lighting you to answer your question, or if you're gonna go sell a part, you know, the smart parking application, you need to know about that. You need to be able to speak to the value proposition. You need to be know who cares in the organization about that problem. So the entire sales process uh, starts to shift a little bit. 
And then again, the question becomes, are, are you doing that sale or is somebody else doing that sale? Um, and, and I think that's, that's the big question for, um, for, for folks like yourself to sit with the customer to try and sort through as this continues to evolve. Who's that Austrian guy that was like the uh, management guru? Can't remember his name, but he used to say, what's the most important question you can ask a cust you can ask. The most important custom question is who is the customer, right? The second most important question you ask, this guy's a genius. I can't remember his name. It's, uh, I gotta take some pills to make my brain work faster. The second most important question is what does the customer want to buy, right? So if you say, okay, the customer wants a smart parking solution or the customer wants to know who enters the mall from where, or the customer wants to know where are people congregating in a, uh, in a train station and, or whatever it is, that's, I think lighting is about to become the most dynamic and, um, absolutely the most dynamic and the most disruptive industry in the world. I think in the next step, so we just went through a phase where, uh, cell phones and electronic devices were the most disruptive technology. Blackberry got taken out and, uh, Nokia got taken out and Nortel went down and, uh, you know, these companies were big companies were just crashing over like trees in an old forest. And I think that's what's happening in lighting right now. And I think lighting is about to be the number one most disrupted industry in the world and the most, the most value added industry in the world. There's going to be so much value in lighting systems. You might've made me a believer on the get a grip on lighting podcast here, Dan. I think there's a chance that actually, when you think about it, every building needs lighting. So why don't we just go with the lighting and forget about all the other stuff? Like that's where the, that's, that's where you have to have that. That's the idea. And that's why everybody's really excited about this. Lights are everywhere. They're powered. Um, they're getting replaced and mass right now with led. We're cramming sensors into lights. So, so that is the idea. Absolutely. But when you talk about disruption and the challenge, um, I, I think the channel dynamics are a very real challenge um, because typically, and you guys have been letting projects, if you specify the future proof product, right? Um, the customer wants that future to come. The future has to arrive. And, and when is that future going to come? And when is the IoT application going to be a real thing? And then if you're competing against another, you know, manufacturer product that's going to come in at a lower cost point without the IoT capability, it's really tough to sell them on the future unless you can show them the future right here, right? So you get value engineered out of the project. Um, and, future and proof. Future proof is smoke. I, and I, I agree. Man. Future proof is smoke and I, mirrors. You got to come in with the solution and say, this exactly. is the software application your people are going to use. And it's going to be loaded onto your windows, whatever system. And we're going to put the lights in and this is how it's going to benefit you. None of this. Hey, maybe there's going to be IOT at the end of the day. And all these fixtures have Wi-Fi connectivity. No, dude, you got to come in. You got to come in hot with the solution and get it right and show the customer this is the value. Other than that, you're, you're a snake oil salesman. You got to bring it hot. You got to come in and say, this is the energy savings you're going to get. This is the incentive you're going to get. This is the information you're going to get. And here is how you're going to use it, man. Huh? That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. Otherwise, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a real sale. In my opinion, if you can't tell the customer what they're going to do with what they're buying, you're not selling them anything. You're just, you're not selling them anything. And that's the problem right now is nobody knows what anyone's going to buy with this, what they're buying. Dan Ryan, come on, buddy. I would agree hundred percent. That's why the talk of platforms <laughs> and future that is going to come is it's not, it's not an easy sale to make. So, um, the conversation has started to shift, but needs to shift a little more around real products, real services and real value and away from IOT and smart lighting and all these terms that have become pretty meaningless Jar, it's called over the jargon. Last couple of years. Jargon terms, man. Jargon. It's just jargon. jargon. Yeah. It's like the internet of lights, right? So, so that all needs to go and, and you do need to speak about real, real stuff because lighting does have a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to be successful. Um, but navigating that channel challenge, and then I'll, I'll say it one more time, 
getting to the right buyers in the customer mm. that care about the stuff that you're selling really, really matters because I, think, I can guarantee I you having something to the lighting show guy them, probably though. doesn't care. Dan, having something to show them of value, like going to them and saying, that's always Here, valuable. Here's what, you, yeah. here's what you're going to get. Hey, give me this dollar and you can have this. If you can't do that, then you have nothing to sell. If you, if you, you know, if you're saying it might be able to do this, come on, man. If you say, look, we're going to provide you with this solution and here's how your building operator is going to use it. That's where you got to get to. And you're talking about the channel. If you can do that, the channel will make itself happen. If you can actually demonstrate value to people, you don't need a channel. The channel will be created on its own. The channel, like when it came to the whole LED revolution, which probably started in 2013 or something like that, there was no need for the channel. They blew the channel up. The channel got blown up. The whole channel of manufacturer sells to distributor, distributor sells to new, new construction or to contractor. And then all of a sudden, the manufacturer started to selling to end users and, the, and uh, mainland Chinese uh, uh, people started bringing in their own product into, into, into the market and going direct and, the, and the, the channel basically disappeared. And so the idea of needing a channel, the channel will create itself if you have value. That yeah, but that's where, I mean, that may be good or bad for you. So, like, you had, you had a POE guy on at some point, right? Mm -hmm. To talk about power of Ethernet lighting. Mm -hmm. Who installs those systems? Uh, you have uh, audio video guys that could do electricians. It. electricians. I don't know, man. Yeah, exa exactly. So, so you have, you know, you have different people starting to participate in the installation, right, in, in the sales process. Um, it becomes more of a Cisco type of sale and less of, you know, a lighting manufacturer type of sale. Um, so that's the aspect where I, I agree if there's value, a channel will always be created, but I think it's going to look very different than the channel that, is, that exists right now. Um, and that's the big, you know, the big, big question with um, how IoT, smart lighting, whatever piece of jargon you want to use is going to, is going to impact the business is what happens to the channel, who else is playing there um, and who else is, you know, deriving value from it. I'll tell you what's going oh, to happen. The Go ahead. Uh, I'll tell, I just want to I'm tell just Dan gonna what's going to happen yeah. to the channel what's going to happen to the channel is the strong will survive and the weak will die that's how it works that's what's going to happen to the channel so come on buddy listen to the get a grip and lighting podcast and you're going to be smarter go ahead gregor <laughs> dan in, in your opinion just based on your background you worked at acuity for a couple of years so you you have some lighting background we didn't really I touch did. on that maybe in the bio we will or whatever but um when do you see this being realistic like what year would you say this is how lighting is going to be from now on going forward? I, I think it's happening right now. Um, I think it's going to take a couple more years to really shake out. Um, the first real products started to make their way into the market over the past couple of years. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of channel disruption, how that might look, I, I think that's um, at least at least five, five plus years away. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of shaking out that's going to continue to happen. Uh, a lot of FUD. Um, fear and certainty and doubt uh, over the next couple of years. Um, but it, don't bring, it, it, it don't is bring your acronyms happen. around here, buddy. We don't like acronyms. <laughs> no acronyms. No, 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 no FUD. I don't like acronyms because I can't remember. No them. FUD. No FUD. <laughs> All right. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's interesting. You know what? I mean, the lighting industry yeah. has been suffering from fear, uncertainty, and doubt for a long time, man. And look, Philips just changed their name. GE's exiting stage right. Sylvania sold it off to Ledvance. The, it's already happening, man. This is already happening right now as we're as we're chatting. People are, you know, the strong are emerging and growing and flourishing, and the weak are dying, dude. It's beautiful to see. It's lovely. It's like evolution. You're watching, you're watching the Darwinian results of. Uh, competition the strong survive and the weak die i love it man lighting yes i'm in the right business i love it it's gonna be so exciting in the next 10 years greg come on it man is. i'm jacked bro it Get a grip. i think that might be a good time to uh to close off this episode greg what do you think i agree yeah, yeah i think that was a good end good you know what i honestly and this is going to be on the podcast i wasn't sure how this podcast was going to go dan i think it went really well i think it might be one of our best i think it was my personal favorite podcast actually greg what about you I haven't ranked it yet. I guess it's up there. It's interesting. This is, my, this is stuff, the funnest yeah. one. I love the fact that I'm going to be walking through the internet, man. I love that. Through the internet. The internet of lights everywhere. Yeah. Oh, the so light's going to be, be shining down on you. Future. 
What, what, what was the guy's name in the Matrix? I'm going to be like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Neo. Yeah, you're looking Neo. for Neo. Neo. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen, all you guys out there in the manosphere, we're taking the red pill, blue pill thing back. And it's going to be red pill in the lighting industry, buddy. That's episode 22 of Get a Grip on Lighting. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Dan. It was a blast. Whew. That was a heck of a podcast, man. I really enjoyed it. Remember, Keystone Technologies, K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, man. KeystoneTech.com. Why are you going to go there? Well, there's a lot of snobbiness, I think, around LED fluorescent tube replacements, so T8 and T5 tube replacements. I don't know why, man. I think they're a great way to help customers, especially in the existing lighting environment, especially customers that want to just have a fast payback, man. Keystone's got all the options. They got their smart drive, which runs off the existing ballast. Okay, um, just put the tube in, you're done. They got their direct drive, which is a line voltage tube where you remove the ballast and you put the tube in and that way you don't have any ballast maintenance in the future. You just run them right off the, off the line voltage. They, I think they have, two, they have two kinds. They got one that's double-ended and they got one that's single-ended bypass. So you can go with two separate sockets on either end or you can go with the line voltage to one socket. The final one is they got the combo drive, man. Combo drive. How does combo drive work? Well, combo drive is both smart drive and direct drive. So once that ballast burns out, you take the tube out, you remove the ballast, and you run the line voltage to the sockets again and put the tube back in. Bob's your uncle. Combo drive is really cool, actually. I don't know, I don't know who thought of that, but that, that's a really good idea. So I love T8 tubes. I love T5 LED tubes. Come on, man. That's the quickest way to give your customer, uh, you know, especially like all those warehouses out there where they got the high bays. And you got T8 high base or T5 HO high base. You just put the T5 tubes in there, man. You're done. Customers save an energy right away. They're, they've, they're probably kicking up the light output because a lot of those old tubes dim over their lives. Come on, man. Go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, man. And remember, we're Keystone and Premier Lighting and Atlas Lighting met. They met at the Nailed Convention, man, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's right education, training, bunch of dorky guys talking about light bulbs all day and gals. There's gals there too, sitting around talking light bulbs, how to sell them, what, what works, what doesn't, uh, what, the, what are the rebates like in your environment? What are they like in, in our environment? So it's a lot different than light fair. Light fair is huge, man. Uh, light and build in Frankfurt is enormous. Hong Kong light fair is enormous. You can't even get a handle on anything. There's thousands and thousands of people there with all sorts of different, you know, perspectives and so on at nailed. Huh, a lot less people, a lot more focused on selling light bulbs every day. Huh? Light sources, lamps, whatever you want to call them. We're all there. We're hanging out. We're having a good time. And we learn a lot, man. We have There's an educational program going on. So consider joining the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Finally, Dan from Verge Sense. Dan, that was a fun podcast, man. That was my favorite ever so far. So my personal favorite podcast. Uh, why? Because we kind of we we left lighting behind and we talked about like we left the existing lighting industry behind and we talked about a whole bunch of other stuff. So that was really fun. And I want to do more of that because I think lighting is going to be the most disrupted business moving forward. So I'll let you guys go with that. See you on the next episode. Call again out. Boom.